It is no secret that today's professionals are seeking an environment where they can mentally and emotionally thrive. Workers are now less tolerant of hostile treatment, poor communication, and office drama. A recent study by MIT Sloan showed that a toxic work culture presents the most common reason why employees quit their jobs. A toxic workplace can be a breeding ground for negativity, stress, and conflict. It could lead to decreased productivity and morale, and even have serious consequences on an employee's physical and mental health. Thus, it is important to recognize the signs of an unhealthy workplace and take steps to protect yourself and your career development. Escaping the onslaught of stress that comes from working in a dysfunctional situation can be a boon to your well-being. We will focus on the toxic work environment red flags and survival tips. Welcome to Business Insight and Plus TV Africa. I am Justin Akadoni. Now, petrol shortages, chaos at banks, in addition to insecurity and the chronic lack of water and electricity, have added to the plight of many in the country. Now, residents queue for petrol under the blazing sun for even over four hours, while others spend two or more time waiting at cash dispensers. Nigeria's mega city of 20 million people, that is Lagos, is constantly blocked by traffic jams, worsened by the wait for fuel, spelling further misery for residents. From the north to the south, the country of about 215 million people is facing a conjunction of crisis. Take a look at this report. This is a popular Idu motor market in Lagos State. It's always a beehive of activities, but the scenario is unusual. No thanks to the lingering fuel scarcity. Traders here say the situation is becoming precarious and businesses are almost folding up as the power generating sets used to light up their businesses like fueling them. Nigeria has been struggling with inadequate power supply over the years. You, can, you see, things are very, very hard. To, for you to make a living now is very hard. For you to get to lose one naira. And no one is coming in. Before we go to, we buy, we go to China, we buy, we go by ourselves. We travel, go there, we buy. But now we buy by picture. Because of things are very hard. The fuel scarcity is a something else. And the currency, the new, new naira currency, is another problem. We are facing hell. People that do business, we are not enjoying the business. We are just coming now because of to find something to be doing, not because we are enjoying. As a Nigerian citizen, I entered Bos Island, 500 naira. So and the thing is, I, I know much passengers, but people are the, the price is too much. So now just small goods now to even ordinary surrey here. The driver will charge you as if you are going to east. So the price is too much. When well, time we come to the market or to our shop, we come late and the, the prices of the vehicle go up. So that which we cannot offer, but uh, we are just managing it. But the first question, what we are saying is uh, let the federal government make everything to be okay. So that the poor and also we that are in the country, we feel better. Let them improve whatever anything they are doing so that the masses will not suffer. But if you want the situation now, you know that people are suffering. So let them use their power to make something in order for us. Even feeding now, it's very difficult for people to feed, to chop. This first scarcity, what is the cause of this first scarcity? Is it because of this election that's about to come, or because of the money that's involved? If I may ask, can somebody let us know what is the problem about this first scarcity? Where does it come from? What is the meaning of this first scarcity? Is it from the marketers? Is it from the, is it from the government? Is it from the marketers? Or is it from individual? We have been coming to market. We have been staying in Nigeria before. It's not today that we have been changing money. We have been changing money. We have been seeing election. How comes no money? No, uh, no fuel? No movement? No food? These are some of the questions begging for answers as Nigerians across all strata of the society look forward to an end to the crisis. Customers spend hours in ATM queues just to get cash. 
The situation is sad as terminals are not dispensed. <laughs> they allege that the new Naira nodes have been hijacked by some individuals as they urge the Apex Bank to take appropriate actions against errand banks. Some of the customers are also bothered about the 10-day extension, said it will not ease the sufferings of the masses. There's some stories that they say that the first batch of money that they disbursed to banks, that the politician has hijacked the money. So the bank cannot even issue out the new currency because politician has hijacked the money because of the election that is forthcoming. That is what we had. And as it is now, money is so scarce. If you go to POAs, they are charging 1,500 naira for new currency. Who does that? It's not good for us. For 10,000 naira, they are charging you 1,500 for new currency. Then 500 naira for old currency. That's what they are charging us for POAs. Somebody like me coming to stand under this sun. This is man in humanity to man. Punishment. No cue. I bought fuel 340 naira a day for yesterday. As I'm coming, so it's almost finished. So what is it with the government? No money, no fuel, life is horrible. However, the Central Bank of Nigeria is on ground to monitor compliance from the commercial banks in the state. James Marman is a Deputy Director of Operations of the Apex Bank in Kaduna. He gives his assessment. Certainly there were appropriate penalties for banks that failed to dispense their money, money in their vaults. But in the case of this bank, we discovered that the money was actually sitting in their vaults where the ATMs were not dispensing anything and customers were loitering around. Quite a number of them are open and they are transparent and they are very committed to the project. Some of them actually have failed to do what needs to be done in line with the guidelines that they were issued. And therefore this exercise is to monitor and ensure compliance with the directives of CBA. The residents continue to lament poor services from the commercial banks or call in on authorities to provide other denominations for ease of transactions. They give you ATM cards to come here, that's why it's crowded. They don't give money inside. You must have an ATM to withdraw your money. That's what they're doing inside. And the maximum withdrawal of money here is 20,000. If it's not your bank, it's 10,000. Only the new one, the 20 naira, 15 naira, it's not in circulation. So they should provide that to... The CBN has vowed to take decisive actions against any commercial bank which fails to meet the guidelines issued to them to facilitate transactions while appealing to the public to use other means. All right, welcome back. Now, a toxic work environment is one where negative, antagonistic or bullying behavior is baked into the very culture. In a toxic work environment, employees are stressed, communication is limited, Blame culture is rife and people are rewarded for unethical, harmful or nasty attitudes and actions. Now, Bright UK Ukwenga is an author, speaker, digital entrepreneur and transformation coach known for inspiring profitable and sustainable change through remarkable mental transformation through breakthrough six sense and strategy. He helps with uh, individuals and organizational brands to lead the future by catalyzing their reinvention and exponential growth. He joins us now to discuss more on the workplace toxicity. Many thanks for joining us on Business Insight Bright. Thank you, Justin, for having me. Thank you. Yeah, it is indeed a pleasure. Let's try to get your own uh, you know, concept uh, concerning this uh, main topic for today, uh, workplace toxicity. What, or what rather, makes um, a workplace toxic? Um, well, workplace toxicity uh, exists just like uh, in relationships. Generally, the workplace is made up of relationships. So when we talk about toxicity in this sense, we are looking about. We are looking at uh, the relationships that exist in the workplace and uh, how healthy or unhealthy they are, right? And uh, majorly, toxicity is caused by uh, an absence of psychological safety, right? Where someone feels uh, there is an imbalance of power. Normally, when people uh, get into organizations, they aspire to work for organizations that can meet their needs, right? That can um, provide benefits that meet their interests and uh, they what they do not see is that uh, beyond the facade beyond the obvious benefits as it were 
there are not so obvious sides of the organization that would not be advertised. So when they get into the organization, they begin to notice some of these things that impede their own performance and productivity, things like bullying, things like abuse, things like poor communication and miscommunication, where there are cliques, where there is uh, bullying, you know, there is an imbalance of power. So that imbalance is actually what creates the toxicity where people are not given the freedom to be who they, need, they want to be, the freedom to do their job, they are being micromanaged, you know, all of these things um, making them feel psychologically insecure while being on their job. So basically, um, toxicity is just an absence of psychological safety. And where that safety is not present, people cannot be the authentic self, neither can they deliver their best work. All right, uh, Bright, you mentioned um, a lot um, in passing when you were actually giving us a, a broad base and perspective concerning uh, this uh, workplace toxicity. Let's try and understand, are there telltale signs that uh, one should uh, look out for? Because ordinary some people uh, just want to come to the office, uh, stay on their desk and uh, just do their jobs without necessarily befriending uh, some people. But it is almost all the time very difficult to just stay on your own because uh, sometimes you are just by yourself. The trouble or the drama just comes to you. How do you identify these red flags as it were? Um, basically, they are telltale signs. Yeah, just like uh, generally in relationships, in interpersonal relationships, uh, and uh, even in romantic relationships, there are signs and red flags of toxicity that people can look out for. But like I've said, basically, toxicity is absence of psychological safety, and uh, it's an imbalance of power. One person is particularly um, giving to the system, someone else is benefiting from the system without even giving to it, right? And so one person feels some kind of stress and burnout, why? Because it's not being refreshed in their own way. Um, when you come into a toxic atmosphere, one of the first things you are most likely going to realize is absence of communication or poor communication, right? Um, communication is not direct, it's not straightforward. You're hearing one thing and uh, seeing another, right? And then another telltale sign is high employee turnover because there is a problem. Uh, in the atmosphere, which is quite obvious to everyone there, nobody is talking about it, just like an elephant in the room, and then people are just resigning, right? When you notice that people just resign without even having to talk about it, yes, that's a telltale sign. Then the other side of it is uh, bullying, right? Somebody knows that they are doing something wrong, right? And they are having to, you know, bring everybody, uh, uh, compel other people into that line. And somebody else, someone else knows that there is, there's supposed to be a sense of justice, but that absence of justice is lacking, right? And uh, they, need, they have to be bullied. At the end of the day, their sense of uh, agency, their sense of power is seemingly taken away from them. Then the other side is a uh, uh, poor work-life balance and stress and burnout, which often occurs when people are given more, uh, more workload than advertised, you know, and at the end of the day, they are not even paid for doing overtime or doing extra work. Then there is, of course, the issue of uh, conflicts, you know, because there might be cliques, you know, going on here and there, cliques, and then there will be hostility, you know, because issues are not being addressed. There are unaddressed problems. There are, uh, you know, on, uh, on uh, non-voiced uh, expectations. There are boundaries violated, you know, things like these that are not usually addressed and they begin to spread. These are telltale signs. But like I said, the most important one of them will be the high employee turnover. When people come into a, uh, an organization and in a very short time they're leaving, they don't stay so long, all right? That is a very important sign that something toxic is, uh, has pervaded the atmosphere. All right. Most people would say it's better to actually catch uh, these issues of uh, communication gap you know, more openly uh, before they actually uh, get into something very, very difficult to handle because... Some people would say one of the most obvious symptoms of a toxic work environment is uh, turnover. And people don't just uh, you know, leave their jobs. It's either uh, their, their employers are just uh, giving it to them that they've had it almost up to here, or they have uh, you know, employees who are just uh, difficult uh, to work with just because uh, they feel some sort of envy uh, because you specifically... Uh, bringing so much to the table compared to what they do. So ordinarily, they would uh, just, uh, 
you know, gossip about you with um, their peers instead of um, addressing the issues or asking you to help. My question right now would be, uh, would you really say it's more complex uh, at the employer level or the employee or intra-employee uh, relationships? Okay. Um, so generally, when we talk about toxicity, people usually think that it's more about the person who has a lesser uh, power, if you get what I mean. So in a, in a leader versus a follower relationship, the, employee, the leader is said to, I mean, is supposed, supposedly has more power. In a, in a workplace, the employer seemingly has more power. And the mistake we often make is to think that uh, the person who has more power is always a toxic person, right? And that's not really the case. There are toxic employers, there are also toxic employees. There are toxic husbands, there are also toxic wives. There are toxic parents, there are toxic children. You know, in every uh, setting, any of the parties can be toxic. Um, the real problem is that uh, toxicity most times is not usually identified for what it is as early as possible. And that's usually because sometimes people might not have a very good sense of self-awareness to know when they are being treated, right, um, treated wrong and uh, when their boundaries are being violated. But when that can easily be perceived, of course, it can now be dealt with. So um, whether it's complex from the employer side, I, often, oftentimes it's usually more, I mean, it's easy to see from the employer side, right? If the employer is being toxic, if the leader is being toxic, if the person with a seemingly, you know, greater uh, uh, part of uh, the power, uh, uh, I mean, in the power, in the dynamics of the relationship is the one who is being toxic. I think that's usually more obvious. But when the employee is being toxic, you know, with some sense of entitlement, insecurities, and, you know, most times it's usually not so obvious because they don't even, they just feel justified, right, that uh, they need to get certain things out of the, um, the relationship, that is the workplace relationships, without even giving back to it as much as they ought to. All right, uh, uh, Bright, it's good uh, that we have talked about um, these uh, telltale signs and the red flags uh, to watch out for. But let's talk about management and survival tips as, uh, as we progress, because right now, most people just would want to stay at those places uh, that are toxic because uh, they have not gotten um, other jobs. Uh, they don't really have um, the wherewithal to jackbar, as it were, and yet they just have to sit in and uh, try to survive from day to day in as much as waking up to go to work is like um, a Herculean task for them. Let's talk about how... Uh, 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 one can actually survive in such environment in as much as you have to be there for the meantime. You know, there's always been this talk about uh, trust uh, between colleagues. Uh, it is an issue, and sometimes it creates a lot of um, uh, bad blood, uh, beef uh, in local parlance, and of course, uh, toxicity as it were. How do you begin to manage a situation where there is seemingly no trust uh, between colleagues? Mm. Um, so, uh, it, the, the, the first question would be, are we looking at it from the employee's side or are we looking at it from the side of the employer, maybe the HR manager who is coming on board to do something about the issue, you know? Um, so first, from the employee side, um, the employee needs to understand something very important, which is the fact that uh, toxicity is enabled sometimes by a sense of powerlessness. Now, when I use the phrase a sense of powerlessness, it means that that's, that powerlessness might be a, a feeling, but not necessarily the reality. You are being, just like when you are being bullied when you are in school, I mean, in primary school or secondary school, if you are being bullied, you feel powerless, but you have some power. You can, you can choose to report the bully, whether to the, uh, to the principal or whoever, I mean, the teacher, the authorities of the school, or you can choose to even report them to your parents and your parents will do something about it. But if you do not trust that the school authorities will be able to, you know, bring justice to bear. Yeah, that, that is where the issue might uh, come up. The other side of it is for the employee, you know, having to think that they, 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 they might want to leave that environment, but again, the sense of powerlessness manifests in thinking, oh, how do I get another job? Oh, if I should leave this job, how, how soon can I get another you see, that kind of thinking keeps them on one spot. It keeps them stagnant. And so you just think, okay, I just have to endure all of this. It also happens in relationships. People think, oh, how do I get another? How do I? So that sense of powerlessness 
keep people, you know, accepting the, you know, whatever is thrown at them. And at some point, they begin to internalize it. When they internalize that sense of powerlessness, they stay there. On the other hand, um, what would they have to do in order to break away from such? That they have to, you know, regain their sense of power. They need to associate with people who believe in them, who make them see the better sides of them and not just see them as weaklings of, of any sort, right? And then some of the times it might be that, okay, genuinely, they are not... Uh, prepared for an exit, what you have to do at that point is to increase their, I mean, to gain more power in terms of their, you know, their certifications, ensure that they have the right certifications, just ensure that their CV is right for the, for any role that they will have to apply for. So it means that certifications might be, have to be up to, you know, uh, up to date. They have to, you know, get into um, the right communities also that position them for the kind of opportunities that they are looking out for and things like that. So they might need to upskill also. All of that is actually increasing their own sense of power in order to balance the, the dynamics of the relationships in that workplace. So when they need to leave, uh -huh, they have an option. The problem is when they feel like they don't have an option, they, have, they don't have a way out. Once mm -hmm. they don't have a way out, then that's an issue. The other side of it is if it's an employer or the HR person who is trying to step into the whole matter. First and foremost, they need to understand that uh, most of the times when people have self-toxicity, they've been bullied into a kind of a sinful silence. And uh, people need to speak up. They only speak up when there is a sense of confidentiality, there is a sense of safety, right. there is a, a safe place where they can actually, you know, relate the issues. All right. Uh, it's still Business Insight and Plus TV Africa. And of course, we have um, Bright Ukwinga with us. We are looking at uh, workplace uh, toxicity, uh, the red flags, uh, management of it all, and of course, survival tips. We'll take a quick break and we'll come back. We'll talk about uh, non-verbal feedback, the issue of uh, you know people moving out of the country just because uh, they don't find working in Nigeria, but, uh, you know, uh, clean for them or you know anymore so we'll talk about the jackpot syndrome and of course uh, a whole lot more when business insight uh, returns do join us again all right welcome back it's still business insight and plus tv africa thanks for staying with us bright just before the break we we're talking about uh, mobility of labor People leaving their workplaces because uh, working in the country uh, has become very, very toxic. Uh, how, uh, I just want to get your reaction concerning the Jackba syndrome and what we need to really do to ensure that uh, people find a bit of comfort at their workplaces. Okay, so very quickly, um, one of the things that I like to highlight is that for so long, the Nigerian labor market has been rigged to favor the employer, you know, and then of course create that uh, sense of injustice uh, for the for a lot of employees and an imbalance of power, as it were. And then uh, it seems like the Jaffa syndrome is actually beginning to address that uh, that uh, imbalance and equalize the the ground, as it were. Uh, but the most important thing I, I also like to say that most times employees can I mean employers cannot do anything about employees who have chosen to leave or the ones who are already living, right? Um, the most important thing they can do is to ensure that they are treating the ones who decide to stay very well, because that treatment they give to the people who stay is a statement to both the internal and the external public, right? And uh, in treating people well, the first thing they have to do is to value people, value them enough to ensure that they are meeting not just their needs, but also their, uh, not just their obvious needs, but also the not so obvious needs, right? That is very, very much important. Ensure that the compensation justifies the workload. Ensure that you work on the culture to be a culture that appreciates people, to be a culture that people really want to, you know, to be part of, right? Allow for flexibility, for flexibility where and when necessary. Ensure that um, the, the work style, right, favors the employee also. Allow doors for the younger people who would also be coming into the workforce. That needs to be studied on its own. The, 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 the millennials, the Gen Zs, and the like. Then also, you need to have a proper feedback system. In as much as uh, some people choose to stay, they definitely need to be able to voice their concerns. And those concerns, when addressed, will be, I mean, will pre prove very useful for creating a system that works for everyone. And that's, that's something also very much important that employees and, I mean, employers and the HR managers need to take a note of the feedback mechanisms that we create actually ensure that uh, we can inject fresh energy, fresh insight 
into the culture of the workplace. All right, uh, thank you so much, um, Bright. As we just round up, I just want to get uh, just one final comment uh, from you um, as we close uh, this uh, topic. You know, how do we uh, strike a balance in terms of um, work responsibilities and boundaries? Because sometimes um, they bring about um, lots of issues at the workplace. Very quickly, Bright. Okay, work issues and boundaries. Yeah, sometimes uh, employees could be quite... Uh, emotionally invested in their work, right? Um, having a sense of ownership, that helps a whole lot for them to take a, to have a sense of responsibility and commitment to their job, all right? But in terms of uh, establishing the boundaries, um, that is about their own personal structures. They need to be able to know where to, you know, to draw the lines in terms of uh, their own family uh, uh, obligations and things like that. So basically what I'm saying is they should have a life outside of work their work, I mean, their life should not be all about work, right? Have a life outside of work and manage that well. Ensure, for example, that their work do not uh, go beyond certain time, I mean, mm. certain time of the day, you know, where they have to be spending time with their family. So that, or that, that's, that side of family now brings a balance in its own sense because it pushes them to say, okay, see, I need to have time for some other things. And then they're able to, you know, take a break off work at a necessary time like that. All right, thank you so much, um, Bright. Uh, I wished we had uh, more time uh, to talk more about this issue, but time is never, ever your friend uh, when you are uh, having fun, as it were. A very big thank you to Bright Ukwinga, author and transformation coach, for joining us on the show. We do appreciate your time, Bright. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, and that's the size of the show for this week. I am Justin Akadonye. Many thanks for watching Business Insights Returns. Uh, same time next week. Bye for now.